thanks, Glenn, for that lovely introduction. I was at the Rookie President's Dinner last night, and when Glenn started to go there, I thought perhaps he was going to tell the story of my most embarrassing moment, because I told that story in a large group for the first time. It was a story from grade eight. And so the assignment to the rest of you is, uh, if you want to hear that story, you have to find one of the Rookie Presidents to tell it to you. And that, you know, that's your sort of uh, networking uh, assignment. Um, it is such a pleasure to be here at BCTF Summer Conference. I, as Glenn said, was an activist for many years. I, I tried to remember how many summer conferences I had been at in various roles. I think it was 17 uh, around the province. They weren't always in Kamloops. And it is summer camp for BCTF activists. And, uh, you know, when I, in this role, go across the country, meet new people, they ask me what union I come from. And I tell them I'm from the BCTF, and I am so proud to say that. I'm proud to say it for two reasons. One is that the BCTF is known across the country as an activist union, takes on the fight. Uh, you're, you're kind of famous across the country, I have to tell you. And uh, I am just so delighted to be able to say I'm from the BCTF. But I am also still very proud to say I'm a teacher. Uh, you know, because when you say you're from the teachers union, people know that, especially in BC, BCTF, they know for the vast majority of members of the BCTF are public school teachers. And we all work in the public system. And uh, I have to say, I still miss the kids sometimes. But the other thing about this room, the wonderful thing about this room, is that it uh, reflects the depth, depth and breadth of the work that the BCTF does. Um, it's the hardcore, you know, local presidents and political action people, but it's also health and safety reps, TTOC reps, reps who are doing wonderful work in Aboriginal education, and I know you have some great new resources in that area. Um, bargaining, working in learning conditions, what have I missed? You know, all those committees that we have at the BCTF. Social justice, don't worry, I'll get to that. <laughs> and so it is, it is really a great reflection of the many, many areas that teachers work in, uh, over and above their work of teaching in the classroom. Someone once said that the world will be changed by people who are willing to go to a meeting at night. And I thought, gee, teachers are in good shape in that regard. Uh, <laughs> you not only go to a lot of meetings at night, but you're also willing to give up your summer vacation to come here and work with other teachers on how to make your union stronger, how to make the world a better place. And you know that is such important work because unions in and of themselves make the world a more equal place, make the world a better place. In our fight for better wages, better benefits, better working conditions, we raise everybody up. And it's no secret that countries where there is, is a very small gap between rich and poor, all of those countries have high rates of unionization, all of them. And that's why it's so important that we work hard, and we're working hard on this at the BC Fed, to have higher rates of unionization, to organize. And we're in a culture with not a good provincial government, not a good federal government, so organizing is hard. But we're gonna work on that because we know that unionization is the key to greater equality. As unions, we want a better deal for our members, but that's not enough for us. We want a better world for everyone. Can you imagine a world where no one lives in poverty, where everyone has a place to live? where universal public education and healthcare are available to all and well-funded, where we have accessible, affordable childcare, where everybody retires with a pension, uh, where our fundamental rights to freedom of speech and freedom of association are deeply respected, where all workers have a healthy and safe work site and are represented by unions. Can you imagine that world? It, it may seem like lofty, ambitions to imagine that world and getting there. But I would encourage you to remember the words of Jack Layton, who said we have to be hopeful and optimistic, and we can't let them tell us it can't be done. In fact, that world is possible. It can be done. These are achievable goals. And I would argue they're even within reach, especially now. But we can't do it alone, and you're going to see how consistent the BC Fed and the CLC are in, in my speech. Uh, we can't do it alone. We have to have governments that share those values, that wants that world too, and are committed to working with us to achieve that goal. 
and we're not in very good shape in the moment. We have a provincial government that doesn't share that goal. We have a federal government that doesn't share that goal. But we're making some progress, and if you need something to make you optimistic, I have one word for you. Alberta. <laughs> If they can elect an NDP government in Alberta, anything is possible. We all know it. And we all know how horribly irritating it is that Alberta is now more progressive than British Columbia. That really pisses us off, right? I can swear now because I'm a labor leader. Thank God. Thank God. You know, I, I'll, never, I'll never get to Hassan's level, never. Didn't come from the CAW, but you know, I'm getting there. <laughs> we have elections coming, and those elections are opportunities. The same opportunity these Albertans had to get rid of a government that only cares about free trade, free enterprise corporations and their rich friends, a government that tramples our fundamental rights, an opportunity to elect a government that's committed to fair taxation, good public services, pensions, child care, higher minimum wages, an opportunity to elect governments that share our commitment to increasing equality. This election is so important. Stephen Harper is changing our world. And everybody has their list of terrible things that Harper's done. I have my list. It's brief. I won't explain it all. You can add to it because there's other stuff too. Cutting health care funding, ignoring climate change, passing legislation like Bill 377 that undermines union organizing and membership, dismantling public research and muzzling scientists. The we physicists really don't like that one. <laughs> Closing much needed Coast Guard stations, destroying our postal system, and with Bill C-51 creating a surveillance system that will severely infringe on critical human rights like freedom of expression and freedom of association the right to organize and protest government actions that we are deeply opposed to will never be the same after Bill C-51. And I want to tell you that Harper has touched my life. Uh, my parents were Austrian, they came in the 50s, um, they were both Austrian citizens when I was born. My son Matthew was born when I was teaching in Saudi Arabia, born outside the country. We came back when he was six or seven months old, went to public he went to public schools in Burnaby, he went to play basketball at UBC. He's six, seven. Um, about his second or third year, he said, Mom, can you see if I can get Austrian citizenship? I want to go play basketball in Europe. So I did. They gave me my Staatsburger Schaffnach Weiss, which is just about the only word I can say in German, but I have Austrian citizenship. And he went off to play in Europe, in Vienna, for five years, and he met and now has married an Austrian. If Matthew's child is not born in Canada, that child will not be a Canadian citizen. Because of Stephen Harper. Because of the changes that he has made to citizenship and immigration. And it is just an example of how fundamentally he has changed our country. My parents came here, they were given Canadian citizenship, uh, and we used to welcome people and embrace them. And it used to be that if you, if you were the son or daughter of a Canadian citizen, you automatically got Canadian citizenship. That is no longer true. So it's just, you know, we have to get engaged in this election. If Stephen Harper gets elected again, we will not recognize our country. And BC is critically important in this election. People in this province want change, we know that, the polling is telling us that, and we have an opportunity to have a real and significant impact on the results. And the fight here in BC is between the Conservatives and the NDP, and we know which choice is better. I'm not shy about saying I'm an NDP member, an NDP supporter, and that's what I'll be working on in the, in the next election. This is the first election in my lifetime where we have a real chance of electing a progressive federal government, and we cannot let that chance slip away. 
we have to do We have to do everything we can, and some of it is simple. It's phoning, it's door knocking, it's fundraising. Uh, but you, the people in this room, you're leaders in your locals and you're leaders in your communities. So you have to make sure that not only you do that, but others do the same. And after we are successful in this federal election, we are going to turn our attention to the, prov the provincial election coming in 2017. In June, I was at uh, a meeting of the BC Fed presidents in Newfoundland that coincided with the Premier's meeting. And Christy bought me a glass of wine. <laughs> and we sat in the bar, me and Christy, pals now, man. Um, I was tempted to talk to her about class size and composition, but you know, that's Jim's job. That's Jim's job, I get it. Uh, I talked to her about uh, expanding the CPP, that was my job, right, Hassan? Uh, I talked to her about temporary foreign workers. I talked to her about minimum wage. I talked to her apprenticeship and training. I talked to her about all of those things. But I knew, I mean, there's some hope on apprenticeship and training that they'll do something, though they haven't done much yet. Uh, and, you know, I pushed hard on minimum wage, even though I hadn't really planned to raise that topic. Uh, but I know that this government is not going to do what we think should happen on any of those issues. Um, but I'll tell you the best thing about that Premier's meeting. The best thing was at, I had the opportunity to meet and have a number of formal and informal discussions with Rachel Notley, the new Premier of Alberta, and with Greg Selinger, the NDP Premier of Manitoba. And they are amazing, engaging, progressive people. It's like talking to you. Like, it's like, it's like talking to a normal person. <laughs> and not only a normal person, but a person who shares those values I talked about at the beginning, who wants that kind of world. The fact is we won't get everything we want out of an NDP government. But boy, we will get a hell of a lot more than we will ever get out of the Liberals or out of Harper. And so I had this tantalizing glimpse of what it would be like to have a premier that would work with us to build that better province and world that we all want. So after the federal election, we're going to concentrate on the next provincial election, and we're going to work hard and do everything we can to get rid of Christy Clark and her government. Uh, and that is so so important, as important, uh, well, not quite, but almost as important as getting rid of Stephen Harper. <laughs> I want to talk to you, finally, I'm almost done, about three things that the BCTF does that I love, that I think are really important, that I want you to think about as you do your work over the next two days, and that I want you to keep doing and do even better if you possibly can. The first is advocate for public education. Hassan was very moving on this issue. Uh, and it is so important because public education is so key to democracy, to the world we want, to that world I talked about. Uh, free, quality, accessible public education produces well-educated citizens. And that equalizes opportunities. And it's key to the changes we want in that world I talked about. Number two is keep your union strong. I have no doubt about that one. Such a wonderful, strong union. When I got elected in 2007, I followed Ginny Sims. She had been our president in the 2005 strike. It was big news that Ginny was leaving and I was coming into the presidency and there was a media scrum. And the reporter said to me, one reporter said to me, are you gonna be as much trouble as Ginny Sims? <laughs> and I said, you know, the BCTF was started in 20, uh, 1917. We had our first strike in 1919. <laughs> we have always been a very activist, progressive uh, union that's gonna fight for the things we believe in. We are not shy about that. We never hesitate on that front. That was true with Ginny. It was true with the leaders before her, and it will be true with me and the leaders that follow me, and that's been the case. But that increases equity in our society too, and it's very, very important that you keep your union strong. And the third 
and uh, I have no doubt about this one either, but uh, it is so important, is keep and strengthen your deep and abiding commitment to being a social justice union. Uh, that's what the BCTF is, and so you're, you see your work as changing the world, making the world a better place. That's true of many unions, uh, but it's a very, very important aspect of the work that the BCTF does. Because we all know that that better world is possible, and that teachers all over the world, and this great union, the BCTF, will be part of building that better world. Thank you very much.